I'm probably the <laughs> northernmost participant today. Yeah, good to meet you online, Sean. Okay. Um, I think I can. It's uh, it's past uh, the time, and uh, I'm sure um, people will keep coming through. Um, so I'll I'll start. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon to people uh, in, in different regions. Uh, my name is. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Naveen Basudev. I am the uh, secretary of the African Qualifications Verification uh, uh, Network, the AQVN. And uh, my regular job um, is at the South African Qualifications Authority, where I manage the business development and stakeholder relationships, uh, and particularly the international stakeholders for the, for the organization. Um, uh, Okay, I guess I can continue. Um, uh, just very briefly on the AQVN, the African Qualifications Verification Network. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it was formed in uh, 2016, and it was mainly in response to the, the challenges faced by many African uh, government entities uh, in respect to verifications of uh, foreign qualifications, uh, a number of challenges, and it was a wonderful uh, platform where uh, a number of uh, countries, representatives from many countries, some of them are here, um, came together in South Africa, in, Pret in Pretoria to discuss, and that was when the AQVN um, was born, actually. And, uh, the main function, uh, of course, of this network uh, is to develop uh, trustworthy um, and legitimate institutional linkages um, and networks across the African um, continent and to verify qualifications and to access um, learner records uh, in a very seamless, uh, seamless manner. And we've been doing um, a fair number of activities uh, of the network in the um, um, in this particular um, uh, you know period, uh, we've had some difficulties, particularly the last two years because of COVID, uh, and of course uh, you know uh, we all know about that and the difficulties and the challenges we're facing, but we strive ahead as a network in this continent. Now the uh, a little bit before we we uh, I introduce you to the webinar agenda. Um, a little bit about the AQVN webinar 2021. Ta-da! Um, so this is the recognition, focusing on recognition and verification of qualifications. And the theme is lessons and practice uh, in the COVID crisis and beyond. <clears throat> and these uh, webinars, uh, which will be uh, every month, at the end of the month, we're holding these. Uh, about five in number till November of 2021 uh, would focus on the experiences of Africa and Europe. Um, and it's, it's a whole range of experiences from challenges, achievements, uh, innovative solutions. Uh, what are the tools that is being used by the various entities? And also what are the ways forward? How do we become better? What are the strengths that we will take forward? Now, this first webinar, as many of you who are here, um, was uh, held on the 27th of June, uh, 2021. And I must say it was a resounding success. Uh, we had more than 80 plus uh, participants uh, in this webinar and from the African continent as well as Europe. Now, today we are holding the second uh, in the series. And um, I, I want to state here, and I would like to uh, extend a very special thanks to the European Training Foundation and the representatives of ETF here, whom we are collaborating, whom the AQVN is collaborating with, and to make these webinars uh, a reality. So thank you. ETF, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, thank you for, you know, this is an important step. 
And I think uh, you will all agree that uh, this brings us all together in a new way, bringing technology all together. So uh, I'm very, very happy about that. Now, um, before I introduce you to the participants uh, or the, the presenters, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, issues I've been told to just share. Uh, I am sure the webinar will go very smoothly, but if you do have um, some technical difficulties, uh, please um, uh, direct that to Erica. Erica, you are there. Hello. Um, yes, good morning. Yeah. She will she will help you uh, whenever you need any assistance uh, technically. But you could also uh, just send me a message here on the on the chat, and we'll take it from there. And um, I also wanted to say that the webinar uh, wonderfully is being uh, interpreted in Portuguese and French. So at the bottom of your screen. You will see there's, it says interpretation, and uh, you can choose accordingly uh, for the interpretation of the presentations and the discussions. Um, now, the other thing uh, is that uh, all the presentations uh, are, have been uploaded on the, um, the registration page, so you are free to actually download it for whatever use you have. We will also make it a point to share the, uh, the participant list so that uh, you're able to network because this is not just about presentations only, this is about networking. Um, and I think this is a wonderful platform where we have so many countries, representatives from so many countries um, here today. And uh, it is lovely. Um, this is a wonderful way to actually meet with people whom we would not have met otherwise. So again, thank you um, for being here with us. So with that, I would like to uh, initiate uh, the, the presentations. Uh, I would like to call upon uh, Sean Mendes, uh, Mr. Sean Mendes, who is from the Swedish Council of Higher Education. Just a little note, what we will do is to we will take the presentations one after the other. You, after each presentation, if there's any clarification, um, you can please raise uh, your. Uh, you can you know you can put it on the chat. Uh, we have people who would be looking at the chat all the time, but you could also raise your hand and we can we can talk about it if there are any clarifications. But we will give enough time after the presentations for discussion. So I hope that is okay. And with that, uh, may I welcome Sean. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody who's participating today. I believe I'm able to share my screen, and I will try to do that right now. Looks like it's working for me. Do you all see a presentation? Yes. Oh, thanks, Eduarda. Thanks to you. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, as uh, as already said, uh, so I work at what's called Universitetshög Skola Rådet, and I'm the head of uh, I, I'm the head of vocational education and regulated professions in the the division uh, for foreign qualifications. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about who we are very briefly. We're a government agency under the Ministry of Education with 330 staff. Uh, 85 of us are at uh, the Department for Foreign Qualifications. Uh, we speak over 30 languages. Uh, and we're also the national coordinator for the Professional Qualifications Directive. And that's in my unit as well. We, uh, the, the agency also coordinates admission to higher education and conducts the higher education entry test, something like a Swedish SAT. Uh, we support e-services for the entire education sector. Uh, uh, we also are the Swedish NA for participation in internationalization, such as the European Erasmus Plus programs. Uh, and, and we work with other government actors, such as the Public Employment Service, Swedish Agency for Education, and others on integration, validation, and qualifications. Uh, at the broadest level, Sweden views credential evaluation and recognition as a broad public service linked to national needs and challenges. 
uh, and it's publicly financed, so we do not charge a fee to those who apply for an assessment. Uh, we assess over 20,000 applications per year, and we do this in three main tracks for upper secondary education, post secondary vocational, and for higher education. Uh, smaller tracks are also in my unit where we, we assess uh, regulated professions for uh, responsible agencies in Sweden. And uh, as well, we are the coordinator for the, even the automatic recognition professions in Europe, such as nurses and doctors. Uh, traditionally, I, and I know many of you are involved with the recognition of foreign qualifications, but traditionally, our work focuses on certifying authenticity, accreditation, and documentation. Uh, but our goal is to further develop our recognition statement so that we can provide more information on the learning outcomes associated with the recognized education and training. And I know Eduardo was interested in me lifting that at, towards the end on the NQF and EQF, and I'll mention that. Also, whenever we've done employer surveys, we see that most employers express the need for more information, and they find that our... That our uh, Recognition yes. statement provides too little information. They need more information on what the person can probably do. Um, we've, over time, uh, tried to be more generous, uh, flexible in our recognition. So traditionally, prior to 2017, in my unit, we evaluated all qualifications against the two higher vocational education diplomas in Sweden and duration was a decisive factor. And we saw that quite a few applicants went unrecognized. So since then we've opened up so that we can not only recognize these uh, post-secondary education, which is very similar to the Swedish, but also we can recognize qualifications in the country of origin if it's compared to an NQF. And especially if that NQF is referred to the reference to the EQF, we can then recognize it against the Swedish SEQF and other uh, vocational qualifications that are very unlike the Swedish one will recognize as a more undefined Swedish post-secondary education. Um, we, um, oy, I see that I actually opened the wrong presentation <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have to open another one because this one came up automatically. It will take me just a moment and I apologize for that disruption, but so far it's been essentially the same presentation. Um, yes, here it is. Thank you, Vian. Yeah. <laughs> so a little pause for the interpreters who probably appreciate it as I've been speaking quickly. Okay, uh, we're back on track. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we want to take a broader view on recognition and not just focus on the documentation or recognition statement. And in, in fact, we try to view recognition as a, a small part of a broader validation process. And of course, when I say validation, we, we mean uh, in the Swedish definition, a process of structured assessment, valuing and documentation and recognition of knowledge and competences, irrespective of how they've been acquired. And of course, we recognize only formal education and to some extent what we might call non-formal or informal as long as they lead to a qualification. Uh, and then other actors can capture the more informal learning. Um, I think I can just briefly mention that we, like probably all of the uh, participants today, uh, work according to the Lisbon Recognition uh, Convention, and this is a convention where we agree to recognize each other's qualifications, uh, try to support credit transfer, admission to higher education. It's been traditionally focused more on higher education. Uh, I mentioned as well the three tracks in the other presentation. I can tell you a little bit about how our process looks for those of you who work with recognition. And uh, basically when we receive in our thousands of applications, we check that it's complete. They're submitted online through and, and, and go into a database. The first we check is that the qualification has been issued by a recognized authority. 
We put a lot of effort into certifying the authenticity of the documents, and we do find a small proportion that are uh, fake. Uh, and then at the end, we try to find which Swedish degree or qualification that it is uh, that is recognized. In my unit, we managed to recognize 55% of applicants. In the other um, secondary and higher education units, we managed to recognize 75 to 80%. But we've increased this to 55% from under 50 previously. The recognition statement has been fully digital since March of 2019. And I can tell you this was very helpful during Corona because prior to, to that, we had to print out and sign these recognition statements, which a few years earlier were 30,000 per year. Since then, we've issued them as a digitally signed certificate. And this has really been helpful for us as we've worked uh, from abroad, uh, from home. In some cases, I suppose people are abroad. Uh, if we cannot recognize uh, a, a, an applicant against a Swedish uh, diploma, we issue what's called a background paper. We received a, an assignment from the government to recognize uh, to the extent possible refugees, for example, who have no documentation. And then we try to find any form of documentation. They might appear in a yearbook record, photos that they may have and so on. And in that case, when there's very little documentation, we issue a background paper over the person's education based on the evidence that they can provide to us. Uh, something that I'm quite excited about and our, our agency is uh, really happy with actually is our new uh, qualifications assessment tool. Uh, it was launched uh, just over a year ago. And this at this point provides uh, a tool where people from 66 countries can compare their education without even sending it to us and then uh, share with a prospective employer and print out for themselves uh, a description over their foreign education. Um, I think I could potentially briefly launch this tool. Well, I'll just show you on the next page. Um, so in any case, so anybody can then go to that homepage. Uh, and when you go there, you just click into a role menu, the country that you're from. From Africa, I know we have Eritrea, we have uh, Ethiopia, and a few other countries as well. And when you go into that homepage in English or Swedish, you will see in the menu the type of diploma that you have in the country of origin, and then it will provide an explanation of what that is like in Sweden. And thanks for sharing that, Erika or Erika. Um, so there, uh, anyone can click at that homepage and uh, click a country, click a diploma, and you'll see the Swedish equivalent. And Eduardo and others would be happy to see that we've even linked the Swedish equivalent to its SEQF level there, the ETF, uh, the uh, NQF level. Um, also, very recently, and we've just improved that this year, uh, that we've moved all the applications to online. Traditionally, they came in as paper applications and more of them went online. Now they've become increasingly, almost exclusively online. And now with the application process, we have a digital certification process which exists in Sweden called Bank ID. And it's the government, the national electronic identification that you use for any sort of secure transaction with a bank to check your social insurance. Uh, so we are now linked to the national government secure login that people will use when applying for an assessment. Uh, I should also mention briefly for all of you that we have what's called the NAREC portal. And this is the portal that those of you at other recognition uh, agencies would use to find information uh, on uh, not just Swedish, but other countries' uh, education and training systems. And I know many of us use the UK service. Sometimes we use an Australian service. And there are many other uh, services that people use to find uh, information. Here you can see briefly how the applications have looked. As you may know, Sweden took a lot of refugees in 2015, almost 200,000, which was a lot for a country of 10 million during the Syrian and other refugee crisis. We then had a surge in applications topping out at 
uh, over 30,000 in 2017. Uh, and since then, it's eased back a little bit. We're now sitting around 22,000 applications. This year, we see a slight increase. We don't know why, because we didn't think we'd see an increase in 2021. Um, but uh, I guess it will be similar to 2020 in the end. Here, I show you as well how it looked from Syria. And there you see in 2013, we went from 1,233 applicants with Syrian education documents to over 10,000 by 2017, and now it's falling back again. Now we see more and more from Iran, for example, from India, uh, and different types of applicants there. Um, India, largely higher education, IT sector. From Iran, we see quite a few vocational as well. Here are the top six countries in, uh, from 2020 in the three tracks, and there you see India is the number one in higher education, furthest to the right. The, the vocational ones, it's still Syria, followed by Iran, Iraq, Russia, and India. And in upper secondary, we have Syria, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Poland. The UK also shows up in higher education. Um, I, I mentioned already, and I can very briefly mention again, that in within the EU and participating countries, such as uh, Norway, we have the professional, professional qualifications directive which allows free movement, allows people with certain professions to, to uh, practice their profession in any EU member state. It's a very impressive accomplishment because I come originally from Canada where you still can't do this between the provinces and we've managed to have a situation where a Portuguese trained doctor can pop up in Sweden and work as a doctor almost immediately with minimal hinder. So it's an impressive accomplishment by the European Union and participating countries. So we're the national coordinator for that. And uh, that's a different type of assessment we do, which is much more detailed because if those people are not, for example, doctors or nurses under the automatic recognition, for example, if Eduarda comes to us as a Portuguese psychologist, then she applies to the Swedish National Health Board and they then send her documents to us to assess them in great detail against the Swedish psychologist requirements. So it's another type of assessment which is deep and uh, takes a lot of time actually. And then based on our decision, the National Health Board gives her the right to work as a psychologist in Sweden. Um, uh, and here I, I can mention to you that in Sweden, we have uh, not so many regulated professions. Uh, uh, we have 15 agencies responsible for about 50 regulated professions, and we assess those applications for these agencies. The largest group we have there are teachers, where we have uh, about 2,000 applicants a year uh, that come to the Swedish National Board for Education that send them to us, and then we send back to them for, for recognition. I already mentioned that we link our work to broader strategic goals, uh, such as uh, the integration of immigrants, but also labor market needs. Sweden, like many countries, faces, uh, and in fact, our, our economic growth and competitiveness is restricted by a lack of people with certain qualifications in the country. And these can either be in the growing uh, private sector areas in IT, where it is there just are not simply enough Swedish trained technicians, engineers to help those companies grow. And there we see a lot of people coming from India who we will assess their documents. Or if we look in many healthcare professions as well, uh, Sweden does not train enough. And you see quite a few people often from within the EU coming, but also outside. And within the EU, the whole process is aided a lot by the Professional Qualifications Directive. Uh, finally, and I believe this is my final uh, slide, I can tell you, uh, briefly share with you what, what we see as benefits of our move over the past few years uh, from a more document formal education assessment approach to more of a learning outcomes approach. And here, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, and every, in every country, it is the case that a substantial part of learning occurs outside the formal education system. This may be in industry sectors, it may be in work-based training, might be in liberal adult education, which we call Folkhög School or in Sweden, it could be through labor market training, active labor market programs. And many of these qualifications are awarded outside the formal 
education system and have not traditionally been recognized, uh, even nationally, but especially for international people coming. So we found that bringing these qualifications together in a national framework have really increased transparency and transferability. And we find using a national qualifications framework in Sweden and our linking our assessment of foreign qualifications has really facilitates for individuals, employers and education providers to evaluate levels. It has increased labor market mobility and facilitates matching. It facilitates the validation and, and legitimizes validation on the labor market. Uh, it also increases interest among actors to work with learning outcomes and with quality assurance. And, and we see this more and more in Sweden as different qualifications in the country apply to get placed in our Swedish national qualifications framework. Finally, we find that it stimulates lifelong learning. And that was my last slide. Thank you so much for the patience and apologize once again for using the wrong presentation initially. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful first presentation here. Uh, lots of uh, areas to think about. I, I definitely uh, feel that uh, the people in this room uh, see some of the very interesting similarities to the work that is being uh, undertaken in their own um, organization. So, um, so for now, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, like I said earlier, uh, I'd like to just uh, open it up for not so much for discussions right now, but open it up for any clarifications or questions uh, that you may have for Sean. Um, and in to do so, uh, I would just ask you to just uh, unmute and uh, you know come in uh, where if there are any uh, areas that uh, you may want some clarification from Sean or you may have some ideas, something that is there. So I'll give a little time for that. Um, so anybody would like to uh, go in first? Thank you. Yes. Uh, did I hear somebody here? You can just unmute and join in. Yeah. I, I, I see there's a there's a hand up by Wellington. South Africa. Thanks, and, Naveen. Uh, sorry, Wellington. Just I, I forgot to mention that uh, wh when you come through, just uh, introduce yourself, uh, your the country and the organization you're from. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Naveen. My name is Wellington Radu. I am uh, with the South African Qualifications Authority and um, I am responsible for what we call authentication services. And that includes verification of South African qualifications as well as evaluation of foreign qualifications. Now, I, I, I think like many other colleagues have said, uh, Naveen, it's a brilliant presentation from Sean, so thank you for that. What I just want to find out from him uh, in terms of clarity is what, um, since the implementation of the online portal, if I heard him correctly, uh, in I think he said in 2019 or something like that, um, what what sort of uh, lessons uh, have they learned so far? Because I, I I would assume that of course COVID COVID as he mentioned um, uh, made it a necessity. There was no way you could run away from it. But uh, for for others that uh, would perhaps want to follow, what sort of lessons can we we take from the Swedish experience as we move okay, into okay. that space? Thank you. Uh, Sean, would you like to uh, respond to that? Well, sure. I mean, it sounded like it might be more for the other participants in uh, Africa, but I mean, I think some lessons uh, for us is we still make it possible uh, as a very rare case for someone to apply using uh, non-online digital means. 
And I would imagine, and all of you at this meeting could say better than me, that in, uh, in Africa, it might be perhaps more important to have uh, an online an application system which is more mobile uh, based because you probably have relatively more people using mobiles and mobile applications than desktop and laptop applications and there I suspect we're probably uh, we've been trying to make our systems as well but easier to use for people who are doing everything from a mobile but I think they're still largely work best for from laptop and desktop computers well I don't know what the, you would all say um, thank you, Sean. Oh, uh, I think this is a very interesting um, uh, issue that has been raised. And I think uh, once we have the other presentations and the discussions, I think um, we'd like to bring this back because there's a lot of learning from there. And particularly like Wellington has mentioned in the post, uh, well, not post COVID, we've got COVID still going on, but uh, in the COVID era, uh, the, this is an area that uh, we would really like to share experiences and see what what tools, uh, how can we make that area better in terms of uh, our work. So uh, I would, if you don't mind, Wellington, I would like to bring this up again back after the presentations and in the, in the discussion. Thank you. Um, anybody else, uh, just raise your hand or just come through. Uh, may, maybe uh, while we are waiting for others, I just wanted to mention, uh, Sean, that, uh, sorry, my phone, um, it always rings when you don't want it to ring. Um, there were uh, just a couple points, Sean, I just uh, thought it was a very interesting in your presentation. You mentioned number one was the area of uh, non-formal uh, qualifications leading to uh, qualifications on how you deal with those. Of course, especially in this whole, um, uh, lots of discussions taking place on micro-credentials, uh, also recognizing short courses. Uh, it would be very interesting to hear what, how uh, your agency is actually looking at that area of uh, micro-credentials, recognizing short courses. And because it, you ended your presentation on the lifelong learning. So, you know, it, it opens up a whole area there. And secondly, I you also mentioned very interestingly about the issue of fake qualifications, misrepresentation. I just wanted to get a feel of uh, what is the, what, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure everybody has a view about that. Um, what is the situation of identification of misrepresentation? What do your trends show? Uh, just on that, Sean. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I'm. I'm. Um, on your first question, I'm the person <laughs> in Sweden to answer it. Thankfully. On your second question, we have a working group at the agency called Minerva Gruppen. They work on this authenticity issue. I, I mean, it's a problem from different perspectives. Uh, that where there are um, altered documents, fake documents, uh, unserious. So the the fake. That issue can be that somebody has purchased a, 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 some sort of degree from a non-accredited institution, which doesn't really mean anything, which we need to, to uh, note, but it could as well be someone who's just faked a degree purchasing from through more criminal means. Could be someone who's changed names to their own or changed their, their documents. Uh, and we see that uh, there are a number of these cases. I can't give you a percent, but there are hundreds of them every year. It's not a huge problem, but it is a problem. And we invest a, a lot of time and energy and we have uh, special machines and so on to check authenticity when necessary as well. Uh, and largely we do this to, to maintain integrity in, our, in the system. So we want to ensure that there's high trust for the recognition statements that we issue because it is unfortunately the case that employers in Sweden may be more suspicious of or have less trust in a foreign qualification than one that's issued nationally. So we want to ensure that the trust is high. On your first question about micro qualifications, uh, I, I'm a representative on a UNESCO working group uh, on world reference levels. We've been speaking about micro qualifications lately and I've provided input to work that's happening. There'll be a meeting in September 
in in my unit, um, and we're kind of the innovative unit at the agency, we've already shortened what we recognize. It used to be that it has to be at least a one year post-secondary education. Now we're, we take a more flexible view and that, well, okay, if it's really intense studies, then for sure six months will suffice. We want to sh uh, shorten that further. We'd like to recognize perhaps in the next step uh, education that we might call one semester, that might be three, four months. We're not quite there, but we're moving in that direction. We as well, uh, you asked about non-formal, informal. We, we have recognized, um, we recognized in some cases a uh, folk high school education from Norway, which would be called non-formal. And then we as well recognize uh, vocational qualifications, which are not non-formal or informal, but to people from an educationalist perspective, they might view it that way. So we might receive a German vocational qualification with hardly any transcript or education documentation, but a very high quality apprenticeship and a, and a qualification issued by a sectoral body. Uh, and then we recognize that as well. So we're moving forward from a more traditional conservative approach and uh, we will be recognizing shorter and shorter. Already we've moved, as I said, from a minimum one year down to six months, we'll keep shortening that. And as for micro qualifications, we're open to it and following international discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you for that response. I think, again, um, uh, I, I personally think that this is a, you know, this is an area of discussions because uh, lots of uh, innovative, uh, uh, you know, uh, developments taking place in the whole area of micro qualifications, as you say, and on the area of uh, fake qualifications, misrepresented qualification as it's used, uh, as it's termed uh, in some countries, um, I think it is, it is, again, an area of discussion, uh, particularly as what Wellington had mentioned earlier, in the age of digitization and everything going digital, uh, you know, what tools do you use uh, uh, to move away from actual uh, checking of hard copy uh, qualifications to digital qualifications and how that is done in order to identify uh, misrepresentation. But again, we can come back to that, and I'm, I'm sure this is food for thought. Uh, do we have any other uh, questions or clarifications for Sean? I'm just looking at the chat. I don't see any, uh, but uh, please, please come through. Oh. Hello. Uh, Hello, Hello, is that Emmanuel? Yeah, um, Emmanuel. Uh, hi, hi, Emmanuel. Yes, please come through. Yeah, good Good morning for my end. Um, during the presentation, I uh, spoke briefly on um, labor market studies or employer survey. And with respect to, with respect to survey, we know that data is very important for us to satisfy our curiosity, measure performance, and to enhance decision making. So in that case, I Sean to share some of the findings in brief of the labor market survey because it did mention that employers keep asking for more information. What are these information that employers keep asking about? Can you please elaborate on that? Uh, Emmanuel, can you introduce yourself? please, and your, your, your organization and country? Oh, I'm Emmanuel Pitamara. I'm the academic audit manager of the Tertiary Education Commission, Sierra Leone. Do, do you get that? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I can just briefly answer that we've done uh, as well from my unit employer surveys and uh, they want more we they get a one page recognition certificate that uh, so and so has an education roughly in this from this country and some more information and they what they appreciate most is that a, a swedish government authority has has certified the authenticity of the education in the documents but they really want more information about what this education what does it mean that the person can do specifically what specific skills might they have with them 
And here again, uh, um, if we had more uh, global national qualifications frameworks or world reference levels, this would help us. But often it's difficult for us to specify what specific okay. learning outcomes are associated with the education. So uh, what we've done is we've increased the descriptive text at the bottom of our recognition statements about the education, providing more information. And of course, the, the person can always look at the transcript, which we have translated to Swedish for them. But uh, so far, I can't give any silver bullet, uh, no great solution. Uh, we just know they want more information. We're trying to provide more, but we haven't come up with anything really spectacular to meet that need. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um... If there are no uh, additional questions, and please uh, keep them because we would like to move on to the next presentation. Um, thank you again, Sean. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Lots of learning, lots of new issues uh, coming through here, which I think uh, is something that we will come to uh, when we are doing the overall discussions on the three presentations. So thanks again. Uh, with that, I would now like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Winnie uh, Belimo. Uh, she, uh, Dr. Winnie Belimo is from the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, also called the KNQA. So, um, Winnie, um, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Nevan. I hope you hear me. Yes, Winnie. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish to appreciate you for inviting the Kenya National Qualifications Authority to participate in this forum and uh, share our experiences. And this, uh, so I wish to welcome everyone to my presentation. I've already been introduced. And, uh, Allow me to, first of all, before I move to the next uh, slide, mention that the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, just go back to the first slide, kindly, uh, that the KNQA has developed a 10-level qualifications framework, like you can see on the slide, which cuts across the entire education and training sector in Kenya. Uh, uh, here, I mean that uh, it captures qualifications attained from uh, basic education that is primary school level up to the university level. So you can see the KNQS levels or from level one, the highest is level 10, which is the doctorate. And uh, at the same time, this qualifications framework spells out um, learner progression on both academic skills, vocational and industrial training pathways. So uh, uh, in summary, it's a comprehensive framework that uh, takes care of the entire education and training system. Next to the next slide, please. So just a brief about the uh, Qualifications Authority. It was established uh, by the Kenya National Qualifications Framework, popularly we, we call it KNQF Act number 22 uh, in the year 2014. And it's being uh, currently being operationalized by the Kenya National Qualifications uh, uh, framework regulations, uh, which were established in the year and gazetted in the year 2018. And specifically for the purposes of this uh, forum, allow me to say that the mandate uh, to conduct recognition and verification of foreign qualifications is drawn from section 8, 1, uh, part K, N, and Q of the KNQF Act. So as we do this function, it has a, le a legal backing in the act and uh, the, the, the framework. Next slide. Uh, however, also note that uh, besides this is just one of the mandate of the KNQA, there are 17 mandates. So however, besides the function of recognizing qualifications, our function is uh, also supported I by- know. We also perform other, other functions, as uh, we can see on the slide, including registration of qualification awarding institution, registration of qualifications. So we register both the qualification awarding institutions and the qualifications they offer 
and we do that based on the set standards and we do that to indicate that these qualifications have been recognized for have and, and acknowledged for having met the national standard of what a qualification should look like. And we also register learners qualifications, so specific learners with what they have attained, what programs and what years, whatever details about a learner. And besides this, to support the recognition uh, function, we are developing, we have developed national policies, national standards and uh, guidelines and even procedures. And one of them, which is uh, directly aligned to today's discussion, is that we have done what we call a recognition of prior learning policy. And we have also developed and implementing a Kenya credit accumulation and transfer system policy. And these two policies are very key when it, in terms of recognizing the qualifications and competencies a learner possesses. And um, in terms of recognition and equation of foreign qualifications, we also have a standard, we also have guidelines, and you have procedures on how this process uh, is, is conducted. Next slide. Um, at the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, we have not separated these three functions, the function of recognition, the function of verification, and equation of qualifications. So you will find many times we are referring to recognition, equation, and verification as being related that uh, in, in a way that you cannot recognize what you have not verified, uh, that it's authentic, it's valid, and it has the standards as set on the Kenya National Qualifications Framework. And, and so many times, in short, we say raise recognition, equation, and verification. So whatever tools we develop takes care of the three terminologies that have been defined here on this slide. The next slide. And, 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 and what is the scope of the kind of recognition and verification uh, that, that we conduct at, uh, at, at KNTW? And, and so we say that uh, the, the KNTW conducts recognition, first of all, of foreign qualifications, which are awarded here in Kenya, either by a foreign qualification awarding institution or a local qualification awarding institution that has been accredited by a regulator by the Kenya National Qualifications Authority as meeting the set standards. We also recognize qualifications which have been acquired from foreign countries, acquired either by a Kenyan citizen or a, a non-Kenyan citizen, but for various purposes, you want your, your, your qualifications to be recognized, we conduct that. The next slide. And um, just generally, what is the purpose of, why, why do we recognize, why do we quit, why do we verify qualifications, both locally and, and, and foreign qualifications? And as you can see, and uh, I'm glad what we are doing is, uh, is, has importance similar to what Sean has, uh, has already shared with us, that recognition facilitates seamless access seamless mobility of learners' skills, seamless mobility of qualifications within the country and even across the border. And as this is being done, uh, we know very well we are promoting lifelong learning. Um, and also we are internationalizing our qualifications as we accept foreign qualifications. Ours are also we expect that because of the national qualifications framework with the standards that have been set, Hours are also being accepted internationally. Uh, next slide. Uh, so um, during recognition, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of quality assurance within the process because we are talking of their standards, their benchmarks that you have to base on when you are doing the recognition process. And because of the quality assurance stages like validation, uh, checking whether a certain standard, the volume of learning, the expected learning outcome, the duration of learning has been met before you recognize. This is a way of instilling a lot of trust in the qualifications, in the uh, diplomas, in the degrees that we have. 
And so because of that trust, there is that acceptability and uh, internationalize, internationalization of the kind of re, uh, qualifications awarded, whether in the foreign country or here in, the Kenya, in, in our Kenyan uh, situation. And so we are saying that this contributes a lot in terms of a trust in quality and something that already is trusted by the public is easily acceptable both internally and externally. And that is why we are saying this promotes international understanding of the entire education and training system. Because already there is a confirmation that this has met the test of the day. The standards have been met as the qualification has been accredited the learner meets the standards, and therefore it's something that is acceptable both internationally and, and, and even nationally. Next slide. And um, colleagues, as we, we do recognition, uh, there are various key players that we work with. And we, we have just uh, highlighted a few of them. Uh, that the Kenya National Qualifications Authority is at the center of the recognition evaluation, um, equation, and verification. Like we saw, we have a qualifications framework that cuts across all the education uh, sectors. And so we work with regulatory agencies because they are the custodian of the standards of the whatever guidelines we are mentioning. We do a national standard, then a regulatory agency at TVET sector, they customize to TVET sector. At the university, they customize to their level. So those are the standards we use as our checklist when we are recognized. So we work very closely with the regulators. We work very closely with qualifications awarding institutions, because these are the institutions which have the first-hand information of the kind of qualification, the learner, the assessment process, the certification process, and everything that entails a qualification awarding process. And then we also work very closely with professional bodies. Um, here there are those that are regulated and those that are not regulated. And we also work very closely with governments, both Kenyan government and foreign governments and with embassies, because there reaches a time you need to verify whether this qualification uh, meets the, the other country's standards, you verify through that government. There reaches a time you need to translate language, whatever language, foreign language, so that you, you equate, you verify, you recognize, you have to go through. So basically, these are the few actors that we closely work with when we are performing this, um, this function. Can we go to the next, next slide, please? Uh, can we, we look at the enablers of recognition. And here in Kenya, uh, these are uh, the, what we use, what enable us, what we look at when we are recognizing. So the first thing we're talking about, we look at the quality assurance mechanisms, including the accreditation systems and status of the qualifications which have been presented for, 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 for equation, for verification, the qualification awarding institutions. And the question we ask is, are they accredited? If not, uh, as mentioned by Sean in the country, then we, 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 we are likely to consider that as a, a fake qualification because it has been awarded by a body which is not accredited. So this forms part of the, what we check. To check this, therefore, the Kenya National uh, Qualifications Authority has developed a criteria, a standard and procedures. And uh, I wish also to mention that these procedures, these standards, they vary from country to country. And the reason being that the education systems in most of our countries uh, is different, starting even with the East African countries, African countries, you realize they're different. So sometimes a standard that applies, to, we, we used to, to, to recognize a qualification from Somali may be different from, so what I'm saying is these standards have been customized based on the education system of the countries we are recognizing. So another enabler during recognition is availability of information. And we are talking about information regarding the learner, regarding the design of the certificate. Do we, are we able to look at a certificate and say that this is an authentic certificate 
probably looking at the security features and uh, the QR codes, whatever. So availability of this information really enables the work of the recognizing departments to conduct their service. And uh, for, for, for just for information currently, uh, such information we get from directly from qualification awarding institution. We don't get this information from the learner because of the obvious reason. And in terms of enabling both policy environment, again, as I mentioned earlier, the authority has expressed mandate to conduct recognition and develop national policies to guide this function and to guide the qualification awarding space. So we have developed quite a number of policies to enable particularly recognition of qualifications. Uh, just to, 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 to mention the recognition of prior learning policy, this one, the plans are actually currently, as we speak today, we are in the top gear of, 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 of launching this policy. And uh, even we, we have the support of the government because the president of Kenya is supporting this. Uh, the, the other ministries, the sister ministries are supporting this. The informal sector is really supporting this. And so this is specifically to recognize competencies uh, that are not certified. So through a process which has already been laid down, down assessment process and certification process, people who have competencies through experiential learning or whatever informal uh, sources will be recognized, they'll be certified and they'll be free to join labor market using the certificates or use the, the certificates maybe to join the education and training system. And alongside the RPL, we call it RPL, Recognition for Prior Learning, we have also developed a Kenya Credit Accumulation and Transfer System, basically because our national qualification framework is um, guiding is defining duration of learning in terms of credits accumulated. So it is this system that enables KNQA to look at a qualification and say, yes, you are in school for this number of hours or this number of years to acquire what is expected out of you. And uh, maybe just for information again, that uh, this system is really, uh, enabling recognition. We've had cases where people come in with uh, certificates. Uh, let me pick an example of the recent case we had. Someone claims to have a, a doctorate degree, but when you interrogate whatever papers they are presenting the documents, it happens that that doctorate degree was acquired, was attained, was awarded after six months. So that is not possible. How can you get a PhD at six months? You look, that is not meeting the requirements. And therefore the CAT system, the credit accumulation and transfer system actually has enabled us to recognize based on the duration, the volume of learning that goes into a specific qualification depending on the Kenya national qualifications uh, framework. Then another key enabler, uh, we are also going online. We have developed a Kenya national uh, recognition, recognition and verification portal. Uh, it seems it's almost similar to what Sean uh, shared with us, that uh, this is a, an online, it's a self-service portal to just enable uh, our learners or the, those who are seeking recognition and the verification to fill in the, the documents, upload the documents and it's self it's self-service. So you do whatever you are supposed to do. It directs you, it guides you on what to do up to the end. You generate uh, a certificate, uh, we call it a recognition certificate. So that is another enabler and that is in terms of infrastructure. In terms of in infrastructure also we have done, sorry, I'm using a lot of abbreviations on the slides. We call this Kenya National Learners Record Database. So we have already, uh, done this, we have this database and the qualification awarding institutions are already feeding in their qualification. They're feeding in the learners qualification. So you feed in the qualifications, the learners in your, that have graduated from your, your, your institution plus their qualification. And this makes it quite easy for a, even an employer to come or use it 
to query a, very, uh, a qualification to establish, is it true that this qualification was awarded by this university and it's accredited? So only accredited and quality assured qualification are uploaded on the Kenya National Learners Record Database. And then uh, about accreditation system, I think I've mentioned this, that it's another enabler. This system ensures that whatever we are recognizing meets the test of the day. These are quality assured qualifications only. So accreditation and assures uh, the, Ken Kime, the Kenyans and even the whatever partners we have that qualifications which are uploaded, which are registered on the Kenya National Qualifications Framework are accredited. And therefore, they are recognized and acceptable nationally and internationally. And we are talking about both foreign awarded here in Kenya and the local qualifications. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, the Kenya National Qualifications Framework is a very key enabler of recognition. You cannot recognize until you are sure of the volume of learning you are supposed to be recognizing. I mean, the level descriptors, the expected learning outcomes at every level. If you're not sure and someone is giving you, you don't have the checklist and someone is presenting the, the certificate, the documents, the transcripts for recognition, then I, I think it becomes quite a fragmented system. But because of already Kenya, we have the framework with us. Whatever we are recognizing, the benchmarks are rightly drawn from the Kenya National Qualifications Framework. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is just a, a demonstration of some of the features of the framework that we, we, saw, we, we saw in the first slide. Um, basically, it shows the levels, the 10 levels, the name, the title, the title of the qualification. Actually, this was also giving challenges in terms of recognition, simply because uh, organizations could pick titles haphazardly. Uh, but you interrogate the documents, you realize it's a similar title, it's a similar qualification to the other. So because now we are guiding in terms of nomenclature of the qualification, the level, the duration, the entry behavior. For instance, if someone wants to recognize, uh, wants KNQA to recognize their qualification for purposes of accessing higher education, we expect that either your entry behavior is what is recognized in Kenya. For In Kenya, sorry to, to say this, maybe for those who, who may not understand, for you to um, progress to higher, to university, let me say university education, which is at level seven, you must have attained a grade of C plus. But if someone comes with a qualification and that person attained grade B, which is not a direct entry grade, we expect that that person will produce other qualifications that enabled them to progress up to level seven. So basically, this is just a summary of, of, of the qualifications framework. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think I've already mentioned this, that as we do recognition with the principles that we are anchoring what we do, do we, have we shared the information? For example, what do we require? Do the applicants know the criteria? This is very key. Because now if we have already automated our system of recognition, then we, need, we have put information on our website regarding this is how we evaluate. And this is the do, these are the documents we expect you to present when you are seeking recognition. So first of all, ensuring that the applicants have information on what you do, what you require, how, how they are supposed to apply. This, initially, this was a little bit of a challenge to, to, to our applicants, but we are doing a lot of sensitization uh, of course, through our stakeholders that when you are seeking recognition, when you are seeking uh, equation and uh, verification, this is how you apply, this is what you upload, this is the period of time you expect uh, feedback and such like kind of information. And then uh, recognition has to be done in a fair and transparent manner, which we believe now that the automated system is fair, it is transparent. You are able to access information and you can query our, our actors can query what we are doing. We are on our website, if you 
been able to see what KNKY is doing. There, 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 are, there are menus that allows you to query why, why am I not getting feedback? What has happened? And again, in the recognition policy, one can appeal. If you're not satisfied with the feedback you are given, you appeal, I'm not satisfied, what could, could have happened? And actually we've had many appeals at times, people saying that uh, I expected that you will recognize in this manner, but this is what you did. Some even go to courts and such things. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Bilimo, just uh, just uh, just keeping um, uh, you know uh, track of time. You know, if you can finish your presentation in yes. uh, in the next few minutes, thank you. Okay, it's okay. Let me go through. I, in fact, I think I mentioned all these things. So the, about the determinants, I think we've talked about the qualifications framework, quality assurance, accreditation, and the policies. Can we proceed? Still, the determinants that the same ones we've mentioned earlier. Proceed. Uh, the process is automated uh, and therefore the, the, the portal will lead you on what to do, what to upload and all that. So we call it KENREV, Kenya National Recognition e uh, Equation and Verification Portal. Next slide. Um, guidelines, I think uh, I've mentioned uh, verification of qualifications. It's done definitely in line with uh, the standards on the framework. Um, can we move up to challenges, please? These are mentioned, mentioned. Okay, this is just how the portal looks like. The next slide. This will guide the whatever the applicant up to the end, the next slide. And um, this is the kind of feedback we get on the portal, just showing us these are the applications of e recognition. And um, after this process, these are the the applications for equation. So this is just data, giving us data on how the trend, how we are moving. And this one is a data for, for two, two, about two or three months. Next slide. Um, partnerships, uh, maybe just to mention that um, earlier on I had said that we have key actors we, we are working with when we are doing recognition. But allow me also to mention that um, because of the issues arising on uh, fake certification, falsified and fraud lens, uh, and, and the Kenya National Qualifications Authority doesn't have prosecutorial uh, powers, we have partnered with, uh, agent, with bodies in our country which uh, can deal with the fake certificate. Because the question is, after I have done, after the, the verification, the recognition process and identify a fake certificate, what next? So this partnership addresses that what next. Um, next slide. Uh, just I just mentioned a few challenges that we have faced that uh, one of them is disparity in admission and program requirements because we, we, we get a lot of uh, applicants from Somali and um, quite a number actually are from Somali. And then we have some from UK and some from, so some of the challenges we, we experience in the process of verification put, are related to re entry requirement, admission requirement, uh, different education systems. And uh, sometimes I said, uh, Kenya Accredit Accumulation and Transfer System is an enabling a system, but sometimes some countries it's lacking. And even in Kenya, this is the time when we are putting this in place. So previously it was not acceptable that we have a harmonized system. But now with that one, we, we, we are trying to address the challenge we had. And then the production of fake certificates, it's also rampant. As much as you are saying, we are verifying in, 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 in partnership with those bodies and uh, in partnership with the qualification awarding institution, this is still a problem, it's still a challenge. So we, we, we are still um, putting in place mechanisms on how to address, how to conduct, verify, how to verify and be sure that whatever I'm verifying is genuine. And then mushrooming of other qualification awarding institutions, this is a common challenge, uh, use of provisional certificates. That's Applicants are, are allowed to use provisional certificates. Some of them take too long to upload the original certificates and this delays the entire process. Then there is the language related challenges and, um, and, and lack of data, lack of, um, like I said, 
at the KNQA, we have a national, a national database, but some, some countries whom we, we engage with don't have a data, a repository of their qualification. So it becomes a challenge to verify and even query what is being presented. Next slide. Um, this is just a demonstration of how in East Africa, the education systems are different. You can see they're quite different. So when you are verifying, it, it becomes a challenge to come to a common, maybe to come have a common, uh, a common, a common base, a starting point that this is where we are supposed to start from. But we have standards that addresses all to address these differences, although it's a bit of a challenge at times. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bolimo. Uh, um, excellent presentation. Uh, a lot of information in there about the work uh, that is being done by the KQA, the Kenya Qualifications Authority. Um, uh, uh, the, the KQA has been very active um, in the um, in the network, the AQBN network. Uh, so we've been reading a fair amount of uh, interesting activities that are being done by the KQA and it, it mirrors what you have presented, uh, Dr. Berlimo. So thank you once again. Now, very quickly, I just wanted to take a few questions. I see on the chat uh, that there are a couple of questions that have come through. I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, read that uh, for you, uh, Dr. Berlimo. Uh, one is um, uh, a question that has come from uh, ETF, uh, from Eduardo, that is, uh, she says, which types and levels of qualifications do you rec recognize beyond uh, higher education? That was one. And uh, the other question uh, is, uh, it says, uh, this is from uh, Emmanuel from TEC um, Sierra Leone. And he says that during your presentation, you mentioned something on the recognition of prior learning on the RPL. And I know KQ has been doing a lot of work there. He asked, do you have any standards on notional hours? These are the two questions for you, uh, Dr. Palimo. Over to you. Thank you, Nevan. Uh, the first question from Eduarda. Uh, maybe I didn't get it correct, that what levels what levels do we recognize beyond higher education, right? That's um, correct. Yes. Types, types also of qualifications, maybe uh, micro qualifications also. So types and levels beyond higher. Uh, thank you, Eduarda. Uh, I, I, um, uh, up to currently, I think we are enabled to, to, to recognize all types of uh, qualifications. Uh, and this is because of the recognition for prior learning policy, which goes beyond the academic qualifications to non-formal qualification. And I, I want to believe what you're calling micro qualifications in Kenya, we call it part qualifications, like uh, part qualifications. Yes, so uh, through RPL and the credit accumulation and transfer system, we are able to recognize a part, a micro qualification that someone has. Uh, going to the second question, it was on RPL. Uh, we have the policy and we have the national standard. Besides that, I mentioned we work with the regulators. The regulator for the TVET sector has done a standard for the TVET sector, the RPL standard. They call it PLA standard for the TVET sector. The university has not customized what we have in terms of RPL to their standard for, for the university sector. But the national standard that we have cuts across all the sectors of education and training. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've answered, I hope I've answered that well. And back to you, Nivan. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bilimo. Really appreciate it. And once again, thank you. Uh, for the presentation. Is there any burning question or clarifications? I see, Emmanuel, your hand is up there. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, was that your question or do you have a follow-up question? 
you're you're on mute, Emmanuel. Okay. Um, okay. Let me use this opportunity to thank Dr. Bulima for such a presentation. Um, she spoke well on operationalization of KMQF, but I want to know how removal of qualification is done. Thank you. How, how what? Please, Emmanuel. I, I want I to know how removal, removal of qualifications from the NQF is done. Uh, Winnie, uh, he's asking removal. How do you take the qualifications out of the NQF when, if necessary, that is? Uh, I'm not sure I've understood the question. Um, maybe a clarification because the removal, I don't understand how that is. Uh, because uh, at KNQ, KNQ is the custodian of the qualifications. Now, because of the database that we have established, we have kind of established a register of all qualifications that are awarded in, in, in our country. And um, through the act, uh, Emmanuel, uh, let me also mention that uh, we accredit a qualification awarding institution and a program for a period, a certain period of time, only for four years. After four years, you are supposed to apply for reaccreditation uh, simply because the education, maybe there are, new, there are new changes within whatever was accredited. And so if, if, if you, you don't apply for re-accreditation, then it means you, don't, you are not part of that register. I don't know if that is what you, you are seeking to understand. Okay, yeah. 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 All right, yeah. all right, all right. Thank you. Uh, Gab, uh, Gabzile, I see your hand is up. Oh, thank you, thank you, Naveen. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, doctor, for the presentation. Um, I heard you listed entry requirements as uh, part of the challenges. Sorry, Gabzile, you... can you introduce yourself? Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I also forgot that you asked us to introduce ourselves before we speak. I'm Gabsila Chachwayo from Eswatini. Um, they they call me Gabi because Gabsila is very long. But yes, I'm I'm commonly known as Gabi from the Eswatini Higher Education Council. So now back to my question on entry requirements. Uh, Doctor listed that as one of the challenges, and it is a challenge that we also come across here in Eswatini, where you find that the, the, the applicant barely met the entry requirements into the program that they studied. And I'd like to know how, not just doctor, I'd like to know how everybody, all of us as verification practitioners, how we handle a situation where you find that somebody has acquired the qualification, they have the qualification, it's an authentic qualification and so on. Every, all the boxes checked, but the only challenge is that they barely made the entry requirements uh, when, when, uh, I mean, uh, for, for, taking, for, for taking the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Winnie? Uh, th thank you. Uh, and really, th that is a, a challenge. It's still a challenge here. I wouldn't say that we've managed to really address it because what happens, as she says, she puts it, uh, uh, someone comes present their documents. When you, 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 you try to equate, you look at whatever they used to enter into a certain level of qualification, it's quite below you, what you, you are doing as a country. Uh, then uh, probably we have advised such, such, such applicants that uh, you can't, we can't place, we can't recognize this as a degree or a diploma because your entry requirement did not meet this. So there, there, there are certain percentage which uh, agree with us. Yes, I, I, I go downward based on your framework. But uh, remember also I mentioned that there are those who take us to court and say no, this one. So it's still a challenge to us. We have not found a, 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 a quite comprehensive solution for it. And probably this is the right forum for, for us to share and discuss and find a way, a solution to it. Yes. I, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Winnie. Uh, yes, the, uh, this is, I think, uh, a big area of challenge as well as exploration uh, that many of the countries are looking towards. So it would be very interesting to hear, but also to interact with each other 
um, on this area of uh, challenge. Gabzilia, I see your hand is still up. Is it an old hand? Um, uh, I, I guess it's an old hand. Uh, it's okay. Um, so I would like to now take this opportunity to move on to the final presentation. Um, but just before I do that, I, I just want to uh, make a request. Uh, I have spoken about the AQVN, the network. So uh, I would really ex uh, like to extend, um, you know, an invitation for all of you, and particularly those in the in the continent, the African continent, to to be in touch with the AQVN network, the council. Uh, we will provide all the details on how you can be in touch with us and how you can become a member of the AQVN. So uh, just, it's, I know I sound like an advert here, but it's just an invitation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, on to our last uh, presentation, I would like to invite uh, Lebohang Noble. Uh, she's from the Botswana Qualifications Authority um, to make her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naveen. Um, I had said I would uh, share my own presentation. I'm still trying to find my way here. How do I even minimize the screen? Um, just a minute, please. There you go. Right, I'm going to share now and tell me what you see. If you see any personal stuff on my desk, just tell me. Um, just a minute. Okay. Uh, can I request uh, the others to just mute your mic? Thank you. Right. Uh, can you see my screen now? Um, it is. It is starting to. Uh, not yet. Uh, no. Uh, it's just starting to. Right. Please let me know when you can. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Good. Lovely. Thank you. Right. Um, I don't know if I'm on presentation mode. There you go. Right. My name is Lebhan Noble. I work for Botswana Qualifications Authority, as already been mentioned. Um, my, I also have a co-presenter whose, whose name is Phil, she is with us here. He's going to be doing, uh, talking about uh, what he does in his organization, the organization that we also are in partnership with, those that, that they help us with verification of qualification. So in the lineup, um, you will see we I start off with the mandate, BQ mandate. I go to BQ services, and he's the last person there. Qualification check. I'll talk a little bit about qualification check, check what they do for us, and then he'll elaborate what, on what his organization does. Okay. Right. So, now qualifications authority, BQA, is a parastatal under the Minister of Tertiary Education and Research and, Research and Science and Technology in Botswana. We draw our mandate from Botswana Qualifications uh, Authority Act of 24, um, yeah. number 24, 2013. We have been given two objectives. One, which is uh, the quality assurance. We deal with quality assurance issues, uh, which include um, registration and accreditation of awarding bodies. We register and accredit education and training providers. We register and accredit um, moderators and assessors. We accredit um, learning programs and we also do institutional audits. The next objective is uh, related to issues of registration of qualifications on the national credit and qualifications framework. It also deals with um, issues relating to recognition of prior learning system, the um, credit and accumulation, uh, credit accumulation and transfer system, as well as the recognition of qualifications. Um, this objective, objective number two, is where uh, the revision that I work for. 
uh, work under, which is the Evaluation and Qualifications Division, draws its mandate. Um, we verify local qualifications. We evaluate classifications, external qualifications for recognition purposes. So what I've been saying is you know, already uh, elaborated in this slide that I'm showing right now. All right, I'll move on to the next one. At BQA, we define evaluation of, process, uh, of qualifications as a process of analyzing external qualifications in terms of uh, their country of foreign context and points of difference or similarities in relation to our local context. This means uh, it, it involves things like, you know, understanding the, um, the education system of a country, the quality assurance system of the country, the entrance requirements of the, uh, of the qualification that you're dealing with, progression route uh, within uh, the qualification itself. Right? Once you have established these, um, the, a qualification is said to be recognized and then it, it, it is compared with national credit and qualifications framework. Right. The next slide now explains the evaluation process further. Just a minute. Yeah, there you go. Our process is a twin process. It includes verification and comparability. Now, verification is the process of authenticating the status of the awarding body and the qualifications offered it offers. We investigate authenticity of the qualification document as well as the qualification holder themselves. Now, the verification of um, an awarding body or the education and training provider is the first step in the evaluation process. Once we have established, we've satisfied ourselves uh, with authenticity of the awarding body, we move on to verify the qualification documents, that is the, uh, the, 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 the documents that, we, that have been submitted for evaluation, that is your certificates, transcripts, anything that has been submitted uh, for the purpose of evaluation. We also then, in the, the, in the same vein, verify the qualification holder, just to ensure that the person who's giving me these documents is, the actually, is actually the qualification holder, the authentic qualification holder. An authentic awarding body is one that is recognized in its country of origin, or one that is accredited or authorized to award qualifications according to the laws of that country. Now, where we cannot establish the authenticity of a qualification, the evaluation process stops. Now, it is here where we find a lot of um, um, your diploma mills, uh, institutions or awarding bodies that of uh, qualifications geared for the international market and mostly the African market. Um, those that are not necessarily recognized in that country of origin, but they are geared towards the um, international market. So if we find such here, the evaluation of qualification stops. Now, the next step will be where we, the body, the awarding body has been established to be um, authentic in this country of origin. A qualification then is compared to national uh, to qualifications in our national credit and qualifications framework, and it's given a recognized status. Um, and the closest and uh, national credit and qualifications level to which it compares. Now, um, that was just briefly what we do with evaluation, but then I'm moving on to how the COVID pandemic has impacted our, our, our services. Just like um, any other service, BQA was impacted negatively by uh, the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we, in 2020 April, Botswana, just like other nations, imposed a nationwide lockdown to contain the spread of the virus. As expected, this um, lockdown affected service provision at BQA, including the evaluation of qualifications um, process. But um, because it, this was an unexpected move by the country, the organization had to move quickly 
to make sure that we, there were no delays in processing applications for evaluation of qualifications. So the organizations swiftly made sure that um, employees are able to access work remotely. There were also resources given to, um, we, well, luckily for at BQA, it's, um, it's common for, for all officers to be given laptops. So the, the organization didn't really struggle that much to make sure that everybody who's working from home actually does work. So even though there were little delays in responding to customer um, um, requests for um, uh, customer applications, that, did, that wasn't that bad because people would still manage to work from home. But anyway, even though the organizations the organization made um, um, plans to make sure that we, we work from home. We still uh, encountered problems with the awarding bodies within with which we verify qualifications uh, that are submitted to us for evaluation. So there was there were some some delays in especially in some countries, not all the countries, in processing our requests because I think just like anyone else in the, you know who was impacted by. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, people were working from home, some institutions were closed. So those delays were experienced by us as well. But anyway, there are some countries, like I'll skip that, that slide because I'm gonna talk to it now. Some countries have very reliable databases for their learners. Uh, I think that's one, one thing that the previous um, speaker talked about where we have reliable databases in the country, it was very easy, even with the pandemic, to um, verify I mean, qualifications that were submitted to us. For instance, in China, they have these two databases, the CHESIC and the China Qualifications for, uh, um, Verification Network, um, um, the database. This is where, where most of, um, actually all of our, our Chinese awarded um, qualifications are verified. What we do is we di redirect our applicants to these databases because they themselves can access the databases and actually um, generate a report, a verification report that they send to us together with the verification code. So upon receipt of that verification code together with the verification report that they've been given by the applicant, we can verify, also verify the verification report to make sure that um, what they're giving us is, is authentic. So these are two trusted sites that we use for Chinese awarded um, qualification. So it has cut down on, an, uh, on the time of processing um, qualifications, verification for Chinese, uh, qualifications. Yeah. The, the other organization that we use, that we've partnered with, is the UK European Network for Information of Information Center, ENIC. The former UK NARIC, um, they changed, you know, they changed following uh, Brexit. So this organization, they collect and regularly update information on education systems around the most countries in the world. I think the first speaker spoke about it, but then it wasn't necessarily UK, it was any. So they have rich information about education systems. So if you're, if you're in a, an evaluation of qualifications um, environment, we find, you know, you find it very, very uh, useful because you don't, you know, you are, once once you go into the, in, 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 in the in their website or you, if, you are, if you subscribe, to them, they, they 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 have done a lot of research in the education around the, the world. So we kind of rely on those to have like first-hand information of what about whatever education system that uh, we may not understand. And then it gave, it gives us you know um, information quickly, so so that we can when we receive an application maybe about an an. an uh, a country that we actually don't understand, at least it's readily there from UK NARIC. Yeah. Um, they also provide advice on accreditation status of awarding bodies and uh, or education and tra uh, training providers in the countries of origin. Remember when I started, I said we will not recognize a qualification that we are not very sure 
that, that we know has not been accredited or that it doesn't it's not recognized in its country of origin. So UK NARIC has UK INIC. They have a list of uh, a long, a very long list, reliable list of um, uh, education providers or awarding bodies that are recognized. So it, we find it very, really reliable. And then there is um, um, qualifications check. Sorry. One organization that we also partner with is the qualifications check. We engaged qualifications check in 2009. This is where once we've satisfied ourselves that a an awarding body is recognized in this quality of in, in country of in this country of origin, and we've done all the research and we are good. We now send the application, not the application, the certificate or the qualification documents to qualification check, who will then verify that qualification to say indeed the qualification holder is the actual is the legitimate holder of that qualification so they've been helping us uh, um, a great deal with in, in, on that front but however um, just like other organizations because they rely on the availability of awarding bodies to to provide information on verification we found there are some institutions who are still uh, you know, there's, there's some delays with some institutions to give responses to qualifications yet, so that we can move on with the verification of our, uh, of, 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 not the verification, but the evaluation of, of uh, qualifications for our applicants. I think because, again, the lockdown has, in, the lockdowns in other countries have impacted um, on the service provision, um, by awarding bodies, people still probably work from home. Some institutions closed one day is closed, the following day is open. So this up and down um, movement, this pendulum kind of thing, movement um, by the um, awarding bodies. You are, today you are closed, tomorrow you are open. It has actually impacted well negatively on how the awarding bodies would actually serve us. So, but anyway, it, it was it hasn't been that bad, but it, you know, it, qualification check, what I'm trying to say is qualification check has actually tried, they've helped us fast track the verification process of qualification holders. So now at this point, I would allow Phil to expand more on what their services are, and then we can take questions and answers. Phil, I don't know whether you want to um, share anything or or you just speak from where you are. Thank uh, you. I think I can just speak from where I am. I think it'll be easy if we go from there. So um, first, hi, everyone. My name is Philip Dupont. I'm the business development manager at Qualification Check. And as Lebo alluded to, we are a specialist in international education verifications. And uh, we've been working with Botswana for about two years now. So uh, what I want to briefly go through is just our, our scope of work and how we help support uh, Botswana Qualifications Authority for their international education needs. And uh, the, the primary objective of, of Botswana is, is regarding the, the recognition and comparison of follow qualifications, as I mentioned. And, and whilst verification is a necessary part of the process, we understand that this can be an extremely time consuming, laborious process. So as, as international education verification specialists, we act as a supporting tool for Botswana to help verify from qualifications of their applicants. So whether that be for students that are coming in to, to continue their studies in the country or for employment purposes. So the, the first thing I want to look at is the, the scope of work and the particular types of checks. So the, the specific need of a qualification authority in particular Botswana is to verify academic achievement. So that's including the high school, universities, professional licenses and, and certificates. So again, like Lebo said. And we cover here 40,000 plus institutions at 109, in 190 plus countries worldwide. And the key thing to note is that all these verifications are done with our primary source verifications. So they're conducted by contacting the official source that holds the qualifications of that individual to ensure the authenticity of that qualification. And to help cope with that, we have local language specialists dotted around in 18, 18 locations around the world to help enable us communicate with universities in their native language, which therefore simplifies and speeds up the process for the universities 
uh, as well as Botswana. And this is highlighted in our, our global average turnaround time of 4.5 days. Uh, but as this level I mentioned before, obviously during the COVID period, that has slightly increased, but it's given for those reasons that some people had had less access to, to student records departments and people working from home. So all the issues that you would have noticed during COVID. Now, some of the benefits that were identified over the past two years of working together with Botswana uh, was looking at overcoming time zone and language barrier issues and, and how those affected the turnaround times. So when we were first talking together, the what we noticed the main challenges was uh, speaking with the countries that perhaps didn't or ha didn't have the ability to communicate in English. And what that did is it left a lot of verification requests pending for for months on end and, and like, unable to respond. So by partnering together with our multilingual uh, multilingual team and a team of local language specialists that are around in 18 locations, we could start to put through these verifications to these countries that didn't speak or could only speak their native language and uh, or perhaps couldn't communicate in English. So as a result of that, it meant that these verifications that had been on the backlog or been pending for months could then be resolved moving forward. So it streamlined the processes and it sped up the turnaround times as well. In addition to that, we what we've been doing is, is ensuring the credibility and accuracy of results, because what we understand from all the perspective of all qualification authorities is that this is what is most vital is the, the credibility and the authenticity of these results. So here at Qualification Check, we only accept written confirmation of verifications from the source, uh, as this will form part of the audit trial that is available on our platform. So that's visible to, to the users, to Botswana, and it's evidence of a verification being conducted at the official source, as I mentioned before. In terms of who we help, obviously Botswana is our, one of the main people that we help from qualification authorities' perspectives, but we also do help uh, Sakwa and, and Zambia occasionally for their checks in the UK and, and, other, and other locations. And we also work with the UK NARIC, or UK ENIC, uh, as they're now called, because we, are, we are their official verifications provider here. In addition to that, we also help universities such as the Imperial College London here in the UK. That's for verifying their international applicants that are coming abroad as well as the National Health Service in the UK. So that is individuals that are, are being recruited by the NHS uh, from, uh, from countries such as the Philippines, as well as. Mm. And the, the model that we've set up with the Botswana Qualification Authority is, is submitting, it's as simple as submitting the information on behalf of the applicant through the qualification check portal. So once that is done, it goes sent straight through to the, uh, the official source that I mentioned, and Botswana will receive the verification report once that check is complete. We also have another model, which is called the applicant model, and that's been adopted by SACWA. So it's a similar process flow. However, the information is submitted on behalf, is submitted by the applicant instead. And then SACWA will have a, a access to a verification management dashboard where they can see all the requests coming through and then download the reports once that's been verified. So with that applicant model, uh, applicants will also have the access to uh, a solution called Unverified, which is more of a view towards the, the future and how this can, in this digital age, that, uh, digital age that everyone's speaking about. And our Unverified solution is a secure online digital wallet that stores the verified credentials of an applicant. So, as I said, moving towards more digital presence, the solution provides applicants with a, an online wallet that can be shared all along their career and they, they're empowered to decide how this is shared and, and with whom. So obviously that's covered Botswana and how we work with them and that, that unverified solution. And just one of the solution that might be worth noting as well, or might be of interest as a whole, certainly from the digital perspective is I'm verified as our solution as that's an emphasis towards automating the process of, of verification from the institution's perspective. So it's, a, it's an integration with learn a record databases at institutions to organize incoming verification requests. So it's all one platform, which enables them to see anything that comes in from potentially employers, maybe qualification authorities or individuals that are requesting that their qualifications be verified. So what we're doing is providing them with this platform in one place to automate responses so that once it comes through to their system at the university, it can be automatically matched against their records and verified instantly. So and that's that, That's the, the short piece from me here on, on essentially how we work with Botswana. I mean, if anyone wants to hear any more, then obviously I'll drop my details in the in the chat function on the right hand side, and I'm happy through to take you through that. If you've got any questions, also ask that. But I'm, I can take this offline as well if you'd like. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.
uh, Lebo, uh, do you have uh, a more of your presentation or is that? Uh... Right, that brings the end of uh, our, pre okay. our presentation. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, you so much, uh, Lebo. Thank you. And thank you, Phil. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. Lots of uh, um, interesting issues. I see a lot of similarities uh, in the three presentations. Um, so uh, uh, I'd just like to go for questions and clarifications, but I also I'm just looking at the time and I must say uh, we have gone exceeded uh, uh, away from what we had decided. Uh, I'm just hoping for the next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, we can start winding up uh, this, uh, this excellent informative uh, webinar and I see um, uh, I'm sure there are a couple of questions for Lebohang and Phil. I see there's a question uh, uh, that has come through, um, and that's uh, does Botswana have a reliable verification link for qualifications from India? And this is from Miriam from Zakwa, the Zambian Qualifications Authority. Uh, she says um, they continue to have challenges and delays uh, from India. Uh, so, um, uh, Lebo, would you like to take this? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, we explained the same thing, actually. Um, even though we've gone the qualification uh, check route, they also experienced the same delays with verifying uh, qualifications from India. I mean, uh, yeah, um, it, it's a challenge we are facing. I mean, we have, we have, we have, we have nothing that we do apart from just, you know, um, sending emails just like you would or going the qualification check route. Uh, phone calls sometimes don't really work. And I've, what we've noticed as well, um, uh, the, the, I think most of the structures in India don't prefer emails um, on, on several occasions, like once or twice, I think we've received had mail, you know, snail mail responses, which doesn't really work in this era, I must admit. So yeah, Mary, I'm sorry, you haven't got anything that's different from what you're doing. You're experiencing the same thing. It got in worse actually with the pandemic. I think, yeah. Yes, I I, I do uh, recognize that. And in Sakwa, we've been uh, at the South African Qualifications Authority. We've been working very closely on the verifications with India because India is one of the countries from where we do receive a large number of applications. Uh, so it is an interesting challenge. I know there's a lot of work that is being done um, on trying to centralize, streamline uh, the Indian uh, and the student learner records, but I think there's a way to go there. Uh, but yes, I do, I do recognize that also. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Lebohang and Phil? Um, you can just come through. Um, just a suggestion, Naveen, I'm just coming through. On India, I think it seems to be a common problem that um, we are all facing. We probably need to just see how we can uh, put our heads together and, um, uh, and chat with our colleagues in, uh, in India. And I do know that as AQVN, we did make a bit of some contacts through GDN. Uh, of um, you know the two institutions from government and um, uh, th that were set up I think it's like three years ago yeah and uh, so maybe we need as a QVN to just uh, um, uh, probably go in and uh, have some discussions to see how we can actually get uh, the verifications done for India I do know that they did mention they were just setting up and it depended on which institutions, which universities had registered with them. But this is like three years down the line, there's probably some progress so that then we can unlock um, India. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I agree, Miriam. Uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, the GDN is the Hrunigan Declaration Network. Uh, it's a global network which focuses on strengthening learner records uh, digital uh, digital learner records, and there's been a fair amount of collaborations. I know Zakwa, I know South Africa, and there are other countries 
uh, who have been working very closely with uh, the GDN. Uh, Miriam has also been on the board of the GDN. Uh, so there's been a lot of work there and a lot of it with uh, collaborations with India. India was trying, and like Miriam mentioned three years ago, India has been uh, trying to um, streamline their learner records through two agencies. So, uh, and it is right that they may have actually had some progress. So I think you're right, Miriam, it's, it's time because the number of applications to most countries from India is quite high. So the more uh, sooner we put our heads together, uh, the better it would be for all of us. So yes, I agree to that. Um, any uh, questions, uh, burning questions for Lebohang and Phil? Uh, if not, I would like to just open the floor uh, to, uh, you know, any, uh, uh, what I mentioned about, you know, the similarities on many issues, I've been taking down, uh, taking some notes around, you know, uh, a lot of uh, mention being made on, uh, especially uh, after the COVID pandemic on the whole automation. Uh, in fact, uh, so I know in South Africa, the whole focus has been automation, automation, automation and the varieties of uh, issues around increasing automation, digitization of learner records is the, is the way of the future. Uh, and I think that is one of the areas that has come very strongly. Uh, a lot has been mentioned on automation, digitization of application processes, which has led to uh, less time being spent, the whole bureaucracy of delays uh, is being addressed by the whole process. Um, again, a lot of mention being made on accreditation, both challenges, uh, the accreditation issues of institutions, the differences on accreditation from country to country, uh, the challenges that countries face because another country may have a very different uh, definition of how accreditation is being done in their countries. That is an important area. Um, a lot of tools also being sh been shared, uh, particularly um, with, the, with the COVID pandemic, uh, tools uh, to ease the, the delays, particularly the, the delays uh, from foreign institutions to the host, in, uh, you know, host agency and vice versa. Um, so any, uh, any points that uh, you would like to raise there? I think one of the things that, and it, it, I think it mirrors what Miriam had mentioned, the, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from each other, uh, from our own experiences, but also sharing from other experiences that have been shared here, but also in terms of the network as such. Uh, I think it is a really important opportunity that we can have to learn from each other. But uh, I'd like to just hear from anybody uh, in, in the group um, on some of the, you know, the takeaways that you may have, uh, you may have from this webinar. Um, as you will be just, you, you, you might be needing some time to just think this through. Um, uh, just on your chats, you will see that uh, Erica has been uh, putting up uh, messages around how uh, you can download uh, the presentations, the three presentations um, uh, on the AQVN page. Uh, so please feel free. We will also, like I said, we will make sure that the list of participants uh, are shared because that is one of the most important things also in being able to keep in touch, to keep to follow up uh, after this webinar. Uh, so lots of interesting things coming on to the chat. Um, any, any, uh, anyone would like to say a few words on um, some of the learnings? All right, uh, if not, um, I, um, I just wanted to uh, thank you again. Thank you so much to the presenters um, on, um, you know, very interesting areas of learning, 
and sharing uh, on this whole verification and recognition of qualifications. And uh, what is really interesting is in the time of the pandemic, lots of changes. I find it it's interesting. The pandemic has brought in a lot of grief, uh, sadness to everybody in different measures. And yet it has also brought in opportunities. And I think that is a very interesting area that we can uh, you know, benefit from these opportunities in the long run. But um, I would like to just invite uh, Eduarda to say a few words uh, from the ETF, just a uh, few words, Edwarda. Um, again, thanking uh, the ETF for um, collaborating uh, so well and taking us through, you know, for the next few months until November. So uh, I see Miriam is saying a group photo, of someone, but I'll, I'll just uh, go to that, Miriam. But for now, uh, Edwarda, you're on the platform. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not unmuted. Thanks a lot. It was really a very informative session today. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, maybe I would say just a few words. Um, I have seen a, a very interesting emphasis on partnership. For example, partnership between those who check and those who compare. So that's quite an interesting solution. So this kind of specialization with tools uh, advanced, uh, digital, and allowing really to, to uh, address some of the challenges that have been indicated, for, for example, by Sweden, by, 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 our, uh, by Winnie from KMQA, and also by, by Botswana. And thanks a lot. This example from, of, of this cooperation, um, BQA with qualification check was uh, amazing, I would say, very interesting. I'd like also to mention that I, kind of very much appreciated the fact that recognition appears with wider also social purposes, seamless mobility, access to lifelong learning. And even of course the important topic that was not maybe very well discussed except by Sweden on the recognition um, validation of learning of refugees and migrants. And there are so many, uh, notably for example in Kenya and I'm sure Kenya has uh, developed a special, let's say, approach uh, and tools, procedures for the many uh, migrants, refugees without documents. Um, uh, it, their integration, social economic integration is fundamental. So this social role of recognition has been uh, well uh, highlighted um, and, and I find this very, very interesting. Of course, the digitalization, all the innovation, uh, the new tools is, 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 is important and, I'm, I'm happy that this is coming uh, is, is coming so clear from all the presentations and this exchange of of, uh, of, of these tools information on all these uh, novelties is is certainly very a, a fundamental added value let's say of this particular uh, webinar today um, of course uh, I, there are also requests for example Madagascar um, requesting how to access, how to be part, or how to have data in the, in, in the Swedish uh, 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 qualifications verification tool. Um, that's also something that maybe can be followed up with Sean. Actually, we saw that in the Swedish uh, qualifications verification tool, we have only two African countries in that database, Eritrea and Ethiopia. Maybe something uh, that could also be, be further discussed with with that particular uh, country, if, if of interest. Uh, and um, just to finalize, I'd like to make a point here. I think we have been discussing in the two webinars so far very much about challenges from the point of view of the recognition bodies. But we didn't hear much about the challenges from the point of view of the applicants, the candidates. Maybe at the next webinar, this could also be somehow included in the in the presentations, because in the end, they are the beneficiaries, they, they are the reason why this entire uh, me mechanisms policies are, uh, are, are developed and, and, and how they evolve. This is all for the, the good of the applicants and candidates, their integration, mobility and you know, welfare. Um, just to finalize, I would like also to announce that the next uh, peer learning webinar of the African Continental Qualifications Framework is coming 
Uh, it will take place on the 23rd of September and you will all receive invitations and the program is very interesting, uh, dedicated very much to important topics such as the learning outcomes approach in, the co in various learning and qualifications contexts, as well as then uh, the start of discussion on levels, level descriptors for the future African continental qualifications framework. That is, a, I think, a, a very important project for all of us sitting here uh, today. And thank you so much, uh, Navim, also for your brilliant uh, chair <laughs> role today. It's really, yeah, very kind and cordial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edward. You have uh, summarized wonderfully. Uh, you raised very interesting, uh, you know, interesting points, uh, points to think about. Uh, I like the interesting area that you talk about. Uh, you know, uh, we, we tend to forget the perspectives of applicants. I mean, that's why we are all here. That's why we are all doing this work and uh, to see what's the experiences of the applicants in this whole journey in the recognition of qualifications. Uh, and definitely this is something one will keep in mind uh, going forward in, in the webinar. So thank you, thank you, uh, thank you once again for that. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to end this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Miriam had started this last, uh, at the last month, uh, she she would request everybody to switch on their cameras. I know this is a little bit of a sudden uh, request, but if you can do that, um, may I ask uh, maybe Erica or uh, to uh, to click a photograph so we have a group photo. Uh, sure. uh, technology, lovely technology here. So if you can do that, that would be wonderful, and uh, we can take it from there. Uh, I see people are putting on their cameras. Um, that was great. Um, Erica, would you do the uh, the service for us in terms of clicking of the a group photograph? Yes, of course, no problem. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. Okay, we can go for uh, it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> there we go, lovely. <laughs> so. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I know you have busy, a busy day, a busy afternoon, but I really thank you for all joining us for this webinar, a very interesting sharing of experience. Uh, and as um, Edwarda mentioned, uh, we will see you and many more others uh, for the next webinar, the third in the series uh, in uh, late September. So uh, see you all then. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Navi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.